You're listening to The Bible for Normal People, the only God-ordained podcast on the internet. Serious talk about the sacred book. I'm Pete Enns. And I'm Jared Bias. Hello, normal people. Welcome to The Bible for Normal People podcast. Glad to have you here. Our topic today... Now listen carefully. Our topic today is the Gospels as memories of Jesus. And our guest is a New Testament scholar, Anthony Ledun, who deals a lot with Jesus and Jesus and history and why the Gospels look the way they do. He, he called himself a Jesus stuff. specialist. He's a Jesus he specialist. He specializes in Jesus. It's amazing. What a job. That's, yep. Yeah, that's, it, it, it's good work if you can get it. <laughs> not many, jo- not many jobs Jesus. out there. Job descriptions. Anyone yeah, specializing in Jesus? I'm a Jesus expert. <laughs> I've mastered the Lord. So. <laughs> anyway, actually, you know, the thing is that it's, it's, it's funny, but, you know, mastering Jesus is not what we're joking mm-hmm. around, but it's the Gospels are written products, and people do study those things, and people have ideas about why they look the way that they do. And what Anthony is bringing out is the role of memory, and he uses this phrase social memory theory, which sounds complicated, but you take let me take a stab at defining that. Oh, you I think I can sort of. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's the idea that uh, as community, socially, we construct our memories. We're influencing, we're influencing our memories as a group, and so when we're remembering stories, or remembering events, um, we're doing that kind of collectively, and it shapes how it comes out. And 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 we tell those. We're selective in what we remember because of the needs of the community or just what we're after. And the Gospels look different because of the needs of communities and when they were written. And so, so you know, memories are just sort of out there, sort of like isolated things. But we have to put them together in a story, which is what the Gospels are. And, and that's sort of a way of accounting for why they're different and why they look the way they do. In fact, why it's like inevitable that you're going to have... You know, different. If you're going to tell more than one version of anything, you're going to have differences because of how people think and recall and why they recall and the social community that they're a part of. All that stuff comes into account. And to me, it's just fascinating to think of the Gospels and being different and why they're different and trying to understand that rather than being fixated on, well, they all have to be saying the same thing because right. it's about Jesus. And uh, Anthony will talk about at the very beginning about that, why they tried that for a while and it wasn't and working. And I hope that, you know, as our listeners uh, hear what he's talking about, that that doesn't, you know, for me, it's, it's always sad to see people who are just fixated on that because there's such a richness to the whole, all of the texts in, in the Bible, but in the Gospels particularly, that you miss if you're so focused on, wait, are you saying, just tell me flat out, are you saying this historically accurate mm-hmm. facts or is it not? Right. And that's such a two-dimensional way of seeing that there's intentional, and maybe even some unintentional, but there's definitely some intentional reasons why these books are stacked next to each other and they have differences. Right. And so it's much more interesting to ask why mm-hmm. do we have those differences. And, and rather, and even when we use words like contradiction, I mean, in, in a sense, there are things in the Gospels that contradict each other, but calling them contradictions already privileges sort of this logical, analytical, where they should be the same. And a contradiction is therefore a problem, rather than allowing the gospel writers to construct the memories, so to speak. I I guess Mm -hmm. that's sort of the way Anthony puts it. It gets a little bit complex, but that's good. We're talking about an important thing here. Well, maybe we should let him talk about it. I don't know. I guess so. We've been talking a lot. Okay. Well, let's let's get... (laughs) (laughs) We'll remember this event differently. We'll remember this exactly. (laughs) All right, that's All right. it. Let's uh, let's uh, let's move on with this uh, episode with Anthony Ladon. So, I mean, without any filter at all, y- your regular time sequence doesn't really have these beginnings, climaxes, and ends. What we do is we narrativize our perceptions of time and create these stories that we that make sense to us. And this is exactly what's happening with the Gospels. Hello, Anthony. Welcome to the podcast. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. You sound excited. 
Uh, you know what? I am so excited. I've been filling out a year-end report all day, and, um, and it's nice to take a, take a break and, and talk about something that I love to talk about. Okay. Which is uh, baseball? <laughs> hey, I saw that you uh, went to your first game at AT and T Park in San Francisco. I, I wanted did. to that ask. Was actually, you quite, that. it was wonderful because I went with friends, and they happened to have very, very good seats. and And it was it was interesting because I, I, they played the Phillies, which is here in our neighborhood. I'm not a right. fan, but I, I never go to Phillies games. I had to go to San Francisco to watch the Phillies, which was a bit depressing. But yeah, no. If you had to compare. The, the new Yankee Stadium to to uh, San Francisco Stadium, what, what, what would you... Well, uh, honestly, I, I like AT&T Park better. I like most stadiums better than Yankee Stadium for the simple <laughs> fact that you can't get to Yankee Stadium. Uh, well, that, that as a Giants fan, that, that warms my heart to hear, yeah. so thank you. Well, that's okay. That's all I'm giving you, though. Okay. They, they stink this year, by the way. Oh, <laughs> they are absolutely... <laughs> But they beat the Dodgers at 5 a.m. last night, so I'm happy about that. Okay. Yeah. I, really? Oh, God. Well, it was 2 a.m. in San Francisco, but I'm on the East Coast, you see. Right. So, exactly. anyway. Oh, anyway. Well, listen, Anthony, I appreciate you coming on here. And Jared and I, we want to talk to you about sort of an important part of the New Testament, the Gospels. And you've read them, right? I, I've, 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 if you I've, haven't read them, we yeah, don't want right. you on <laughs> I flipped through. Uh, didn't like how it came out at the end, but uh, <laughs> it, I, I felt like the characterization was pretty strong. You didn't like how they came out at the end. Okay, uh, you must have stopped reading like halfway through the ending of Mark. <laughs> I'm afraid that Mark stopped reading halfway through the, oh, no. the last chapter. No, I, no, yeah, I am. I, I, this is one of the great loves of my life. I, mm-hmm. I, I, uh, I am uh, devotionally committed to studying scripture, uh, and um, and I can't get enough. I, yeah. I, I can well, you know, we should just explain scripture. before we keep going. I, I made his little joke about the Gospel of Mark. Uh, you know, uh, scholarship has has been able to determine pretty clearly, and it's actually pretty obvious when you read it, that there's more than one ending to Mark. Yeah. And the so-called shorter ending doesn't include a resurrection account, and the longer ending seems to have been added later on by somebody who's read Matthew and Luke. Right, and I think that that's not a bad, that's not a bad way to start um, at the end. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I, I would like to make sure. I mean, you can it, almost every Bible is going to have a footnote telling you exactly what you just said, Pete. Yeah. Um, what I would like to add to that observation is that 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 Mark's ending does include a statement of the empty tomb. Yes. And so I think, and, and given the predictions of Jesus leading up to um, the, the passion narrative. I think that uh, it, it's it, it should be clear to the reader why the tomb is empty. Yes, and, yes. And of course, you know we we've got a, a, some editorial additions that that come later to yeah. you know sort of connect the dots for us. Um, but I think even if even if we just go, you know, we end at, halfway through chapter sixteen, what we what we encounter is uh, the empty tomb, and by inference, the resurrected Jesus. So, you know, Anthony, that, that does beg the question a, a little bit that we want to talk with you about today. The, you know, I think some people would be uncomfortable with the idea of two endings to Mark and that the person who, uh, whenever we get this final rendition, someone had added this piece that clearly reflects a reading of Matthew and, and Luke. But maybe talk some about the, the larger challenge here, because whenever people say things, you know, uh, about these little differences in the Gospels, uh, you know, always want to point out the fact that there are four of them, and they do differ in details. So say some about that in the idea of maybe why we have four, and not yeah. just, uh, why don't we just get rid of all the differences? Yeah, why don't they one? just get it right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, Jared, that's a fantastic uh, way into this. I think, look, it's, it's sort of commonplace for uh, people who are familiar with the Bible to recognize that we have four of these things. But if, if you stop and think about it, this is actually quite a profound statement by the people who are collecting the New Testament documents. Why four? Why, why include four? It's not like we have 
uh, you know, multiple, you know, four different accounts of Julius Caesar, and we've all we decided to set them right next to each other in in a in you know in a canon of sorts. So why four? And in addition to that, from the second century to the fourth century, the church had another option. They, they had a document called the Diatessaron, which basically created one single gospel. So we didn't have to deal with the, the, the awkwardness and the, the puzzle of having these four different documents side say by side. That, say that word again. What's it called? Yeah, it's called the, it was called the Diatessaron. Oh. And Does that mean it, something? <laughs> yes, it, yes, indeed, it does. Um, it, it's the, it's the taking of four mm-hmm. and reading through uh, uh, it, it, as if you don't need four; you just have you have one one document. So, so would, would just to be clear about that, so everyone that's listening can understand, like there are you can go to the Christian bookstore today and buy a harmonization of the four gospels, where they kind of clean up all the differences and they have one straightforward narrative that takes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and kind of combines them all together. Is that what this document would have done? Yes. What you're referring to is what we call a harmony of the gospels. Mm-hmm. And the, and the diatessaron would probably be our, our first example of a gospel okay. harmony. Okay. Um, and, uh, and it, it, it did, it was, it was popular, uh, from the second century to the fourth century in some parts of early Christianity. And what ended up happening is the diatessaron could never catch on long term. And part of, part of the reason for that is that the, uh, the, the people who valued these, these texts decided part of one of the main criterion for, uh, for their value is their association with an apostle. Okay. So, so it was more important to make sure that we have Peter's narrative, and and they believe that Peter was sort of behind the Gospel of Mark or Matthew's narrative or Luke's narrative. These these sort of early luminaries. It was more important to have them um, teaching us. Uh, f- from scripture, then it was important to to have a single unified narrative. Yeah. And at that moment, at that moment in the history of Christianity, something remarkable happens. It's like the church decided we would rather pres- preserve a puzzle. The yeah. puzzle presented us by four overlapping but differing narratives. Mm-hmm. And we're going to put them right next to each other, and that's our canon. Right. You know, that sounds to me just, uh, it never quite struck me like this before, but, you know, Judaism is known for allowing conflicting things to sit next to each other in some of their sacred texts. And this is, you know, almost a Jewish kind of move to, to allow these four to be what they are and not try to harmonize them, but they all have their own value. And, you know, that's why we say, right, the gospel according to. Right. That's exactly right. I mean, the, the, the Proverbs would be a great example of this. You know, you're, co- you're collecting these sayings, and it's almost, you know, the, it, there, there's a different ways to look at how these things are organized. But some of the sayings that, are, that sit right next to each other seem to stand in, sit in tension in some way. Okay. And uh, I, I think the Gospels could, could be looked at in, in that same way. Okay. Well, okay, let's, we're, we're, gonna, we're moving into, like, something we really want to talk about today, which is how they came to look the way that they do, right? They're, okay, there are differences. You read them, you put them next to each other. You actually can't harmonize them without distorting one or another. It's just, it's That's really right. hard to do that. So, I mean, maybe one thing, help us understand, either from your point of view, or maybe what what is sort of the scholarly sort of quasi consensus today mm-hmm. about when the gospels were likely written. Sure. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I how think long after Jesus are these written? I guess that's the point. Right. Well, let me say, let me say first that, um, that scholarship tends to like to emphasize what's most interesting to us. Mm hmm. And I think I think it's uh, I think that it has been the case probably for the last 250 years or so that people who want to make hay in scholarship will draw out 
what's unique about Mark, or wh- where do where do Matthew and and Luke disagree? Right. Um, or where th- where is there essential overlap? Um, I think it's important to realize that even though those uh, those differences, those divergences are really interesting to us because we can generate a lot of argument about it. We can generate a lot of uh, scholarship about it. We shouldn't underemphasize how much overlap there are in these, in these right. documents. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, there's going to be more overlap with Matthew, Mark, and Luke and less overlap with John, which leads me to your second question. Yeah. Um, when, right? So, I, I should also add this caveat. I tend to be very skeptical about arguments uh, r- regarding, you know, definitive dates. Right. Um, but the consensus is usually that uh, Mark is written somewhere in the late 60s or early 70s, and that Matthew and Luke come come along and use Mark to create their narratives a decade or so later. Mm-hmm. Um, and that John, um, you know, John may be written in the mid nineties or something like that. Okay. All right. Um, now he, there are all sorts of nerdy reasons for why the people, right. And anything well, that normal people can latch on to for why people sure. around. Yeah, absolutely. People. Absolutely. So here, so, so these sort of the linchpin issue is that this, this cataclysmic event happens and that is the destruction of the temple in 70. So then the question is, well, why don't the gospel writers say more about that? And then some, some people come along and say, well, they, they do. It's just kind of in between the lines here and there. Mm-hmm. And so that, that has led a lot of people to think, well, Mark must have been written just before the temple's destruction. Mm-hmm. And then we know that Matthew and Luke used Mark, um, and, and so they were written sometime after that. Mm-hmm. But th- that's sort of a, a very loose explanation for why we date the Gospels in that way. Yeah. You know, I, I guess it's fascinating that you, know, you mentioned this dia tesseron and trying to make the four into one. And you're saying now something that supports that from, from a different angle. I just want to draw it out a little bit that you know, Matthew probably used Mark and Luke may have used Mark, but they intentionally tell the story differently, which means exactly. it's, it's almost set up to not be harmonized in a sense. You know, they're, they're, they're doing something distinct, not to, not to overemphasize that, but, you know, and, and the question is, you know, where are they getting this stuff from? Are they making stuff up? Mm-hmm. Or are they just sort of like, do they have a, an agenda they want to drive across? Or are they, you know, what's, what's happening? Why, why do they, why do we have this whole branch of scholarship that is trying to look at the differences and similarities and try to understand where they came from? Right. Well, we, I mean, there's, there's sort of the cheeky answer and then there's a more complicated answer. But the cheeky answer is that we we do this because we have four, and there's a lot of, there, there's a lot of you know there's a lot of interesting things where you compare and contrast. So I mean, keep this in mind. What if we what if we were able what if we stumbled upon four revisionist histories of the life of Abraham that were all penned within the within forty years of his death. Mm-hmm. I mean, we. I mean, uh, Hebrew Bible scholars would be doing cartwheels. They'd be so excited, right? There would be dissertations. People would have jobs and livelihoods. Would be fantastic. Oh yeah, right, right. So it would. It would just be. It would be amazing to 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 uh, and you know to come up with these narratives, even if they're not sacred texts. Even if we all decide, yeah, yeah, of course. There's specific political agendas attached to each of these. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we would we would have a lot of fun comparing and contrasting to figure out how do these things relate to the to the personality that set these memory trajectories in motion okay and, so that, that would be one way to answer that well you just actually said a big word memory trajectory yes we can't yeah. let you go with that uh-huh. what the heck are you talking about Andy? yeah so that's you just make that up my- on the spot <laughs> This is kind of my pet project. Oh my goodness! Right. Tell us about your pet project. Yeah. So, um, 
So there is a, a, a field of research, and it's interdisciplinary. It's not just it's not just biblical scholars. In fact, we're coming late to the game. Um, it's a sociological, uh, psychological, political, um, anthropolog anthropological theory called social memory theory. Okay. And social memory theory does a couple of things. One, it wants to explain why groups remember what they do and how do they go about remembering those things. Okay. All right. So, so uh, you know, I'm looking at a... I'm looking at a book on my bookshelf right now called The End of Memory by Miroslav Volf. Hmm. And one of the things he says in, that, in this book, and of course, keep in mind, it's, these are just sort of little power pellets of ideas, uh, but he says that Jews are people who remember the Exodus, and Christians are people who remember the Passion. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that, that, that really distills some, you know, some really cr important differences between Jews and Christians in, into sort of a soundbite. But there's a sense in which Christians are people who have chosen to remember Jesus in a particular way and in a way that, that continues to be present to us. Okay. Uh, and so that, that's a kind of memory. So, so a social memory theorist may, may ask that question, what kind of memory am I looking at here? And how is it functioning within the group? The other element of social memory theory that's, that's really important is how does group memory, how do group, group categorizations, how do social constructs like language and music and culture, how do all of these spur and constrain what's going on in my head right now. So it, it, there's an interest in autobiographical memory, but as a function and as something that exists within group dynamics. Okay, so maybe t take a minute and tie that practically to, to the biblical community. And we were talking about the Gospels, jumped over to, to social memory theory. Now maybe connect the dots a little bit. How, how does that yeah, function? Sure. Well, there's a great example of this um, in in the beginning of John's gospel. So this is this is in John chapter two, and Jesus says this this really remarkable thing. He says, "If you tear down this temple, I will build it again in three days." Well, <clears throat> it's it's a it's it's a it's a very uh, you know uh, sort of outlandish claim. But what ends up happening is immediately after, so the very next verse, the very next verse, uh, the, the narrator jumps in and says, but he didn't really mean that he was talking about his, his own body. So in reality, Jesus was referring to his own death and resurrection. So, and, and then, interestingly enough, the narrator says, we realized all of this after he had been raised, and we remembered back on what he said in accordance to the scriptures. In other words, what the, what the narrator is saying is that you know, none of us really got what he was talking about, but then later when we were thinking about it, we remembered what he said, and we were reading some scriptures, and the Holy Spirit got involved, and now we really get it. Now we really get what Jesus was trying to say. It, in other words, what we're seeing here in, in, in John is a theologically framed memory. And the narrator comes out and says exactly what it is. Okay. That, I mean, that's a lot to wrap our arms around because we're not used to thinking of, I guess, of we, who's we? Your average person who we have the finger on our pulse to these people, don't we, Jared? Sure. Right. So at least, not, not at least Jared point. does. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Okay, let, let me just try to sort of repeat back here. Um, the, basically, the, the Gospels are memories. Is that a good well, one? Well, yeah, right. I would, I would say that they're sites of cultural memory. They're, okay. They are sites of cultural memory. And like we would find in any sort of site of cultural memory, there's, there's a couple things happening uh, in, in them. Uh, there, there's what we, what there's the object of the memory. What did Jesus say and do? And then there is the secondary part of it, and that is, what does it mean to us now? Right. 
Mm -hmm. So I've got John 2.22 right here. It says, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. And this really kind of goes back to John's chief agenda. John is writing this gospel, he says, so that whoever reads it is going to believe it. So this is supposed to be a faith-inspiring document, right? So sometimes what John will do is John will remember things in a way that makes sense to him theologically. Okay, so remember. See, when we use the word remember normally, remember means simply recalling bare facts. Sure. You mean something different. Yeah, well, two things. One is I would I would sort of question the bare fact. Like, well, oh, I agree we should question that. Well, I think that's how most people that. understand it. So, um, another here maybe a different way to put this is to use the word commemoration. Okay. So commemoration has kind of that that sort of uh, you know root word for memory in it. Um, but when we commemorate something, there's a number of ways to do it. We could do it by, you know, celebrating something that's on our calendar every year and sort of ritualize the, the, the uh, you know, the, the Christian calendar, the, the Jewish calendar. Or we could commemorate something by, you know, erecting a statue in their honor or e erecting a museum to remember something that's horrific. And so there's a number of ways to commemorate an event and it does, th these things when we put them up when we put up a statue or put, put a date on the calendar it doesn't just tell us about the thing we're trying to remember in other words the, the, the bare facts of them um, or the illusion of the bare facts of them it also tells us a little bit about us like why did we put this up right why did why did this statue of um, of General Lee go up during Jim Crow? Or wh why did we decide that we needed a Columbus Day um, at, at this moment in our history? Mm -hmm. And so when we start to dig a little bit deeper, we realize that this statue probably tells us a little bit more about the people who wanted to build it in, you know, 1950, whatever, or this particular Columbus Day uh, commemoration tells us a little bit more about sort of the, the, the people in the 19th century that, that, that decided that we needed a day to honor Columbus. Um, so there are two levels of social memory. What, what is going on in the culture that makes this memory relevant? And that would be one of the, the, the chief concerns. And when we bring this back to the Gospels, we're asking the same kind of question. Like, why did John want to tell this story in this way? What, what is John's purpose? Um, why did he think this particular detail was relevant? And why, why would this detail be belief-inspiring to this group of people? So, so the Gospels are like acts of commemoration. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I think that'd be a good way to say it. So I'm trying to wrap my mind around how does this relate to, so there's two things I kind of want to say, and maybe I'll, I'll test this with you and see how it fits. There's a sense in which I, I want to kind of say that all written descriptions of events are this, a site of a memory, right? So you're, you're trying to do that. And all sites of memory are filtered through some lens. You, you couldn't possibly write every fact of every event. Sure. So you're always filtering it through some purpose, That's even right. if the purpose is to record the bare facts. That's sure. still helping you decide what to write down. And so then all writing, all written descriptions of events then are filtered. There is no bare fact writing of events. Is Can we extrapolate that? Or is it that the Gospels are this certain kind of writing called commemoration? Or are you trying yeah. to make a bigger point? Well, I guess we would have to ask the question of what kind of writings are we looking at? So, like, if you're just writing in your private journal and you never intend anyone else to see, the, to see this, I wouldn't necessarily call this a site of, of cultural memory because it really just fulfills a function within your particular autobiographical point of view. But even in that case, even if you're just writing about yourself for yourself – you're using language categories that have been that have been conditioned into the way you think 
Uh, so even even the social construct of language is going to uh, is going to provide the, and you, the word you use is filter. I think it's a great word. It's going to filter your experience. Here's another way to filter this, and this this does also bring us back to the Gospels. Well, if we just look at sequence of events in time, there there's no perception of a beginning or a middle or an end if we're just looking at this event after this event after this event going on in eternity in both directions. But what we do and what how we filter this in our minds is we're always creating little stories. So I the way I choose to tell a story really matters. Like why does Mark choose to begin uh, by telling Jesus' story by quoting Malachi and Isaiah? And why is it that, that Matthew chooses to begin with a genealogy? This is, choosing where to begin really does set the story in motion. Why does your story have a climax? In other words, why are you setting this story up to achieve this particular climactic moment? And where does your story end? So, I mean... Without any filter at all, your, your regular time sequence doesn't really have these beginnings, climaxes, and ends. What we do is we narrativize our perceptions of time and create these stories that, we, that make sense to us. And this is exactly what's happening with the Gospels. And, and that, again, that would be, you would say, symptomatic of... of all types of, I guess what I'm trying to get at are the people who are listening and saying, well, then the gospels are somehow less than if they don't just record sure. sort of the, the courtroom, the journalistic video camera recording of historical fact, then somehow they're impoverished or they're at fault or something like that. But so I'm, I'm trying to, to maybe talk about, bring them into the room and sort of what well, would I would say, say uh, yeah I would say number one that that this is how all history works history historians are always dealing with um, a particular selection of data we're, we're, we're always we're never dealing with something that is objective in the way that mathematics uh, looks to be objective um, we're always we're always dealing with the selectivity of the ancient mind, and we're always contending with our own selectivity. And this this project is this process is always more of an art than a science. And that's not just the case when we're doing historical Jesus research; it's the case when we're doing any kind of research. And the other thing I would say, and I, and I, I'm so glad you brought this up, is the the whole video camera analogy. And this is from time to time this is brought up, like. Well, what what would it what would it have seemed like if we had a video camera on G, on Jesus? Um, <clears throat> well, gosh, you know we have a video camera in everyone's pocket now. Every, everyone's walking around with the video camera. Has that provided any kind of uniformity for how we perceive the world? I I, I don't think so. In fact, yes, even, it has. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I think that if you if we isolate <clears throat> some moment. Like, like videographic footage, let's say, of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Here's an example of, of a very significant moment in American history where we actually have a few different camera angles of this thing um, and one very famous image of, of, of this thing. And it, it, it really hasn't silenced variants of interpretation of the event. We're always using this kind of data to interpret the events in a way that makes sense to us now. And that's what social memory does. It, it asks the question, why does, this, why does this data make sense to this particular group when it does? Well, let me ask. I think that's, to me, that's very, very helpful to think that way because there's no, you know, over the fray kind of look where you're getting all the facts. That's like an impossible thing. And to see the Bible do that is, I think for many people rather refreshing. You know, I, I know people who get into the complexities of the gospel and to say, listen, these are of the gospels. And this is like really worthy of study because th these are thoughtful, you know, I guess now recollections of Jesus. Uh, but, but this is striking something to what you're saying. You know, for example, the, okay, the Kennedy assassination. 
if one account said, you know, they made the left hand, I was actually there once, they made this left hand, a sharp left hand turn down the street, whatever it is, by the grassy knoll, and there were four people, the governor and his wife, and Kennedy and his wife, yeah, and a driver, And but then somebody said, well, the car was going backwards, and there were eight people in it. And I'm thinking of the resurrection accounts, <laughs> which, which differ, you know, rather significantly in places and uh, are hard to harmonize. Sure. How, does, how does social memory theory yeah. fit into that or does it? Does it sort of explain right. things like that or is this that a whole different category altogether? Sure. Well, all right. So there's there's a uh, there, there's a great line that my friend uh, who is also a, 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 a gospels uh, aficionado and his name is Chris Keith. He's he he always makes this point, and I love it. He says, "Yeah, look, there's a lot of differences here, um, but in each of these four accounts, in none of these accounts is Jesus like a pirate." You know, it's it's like there are limits to what we can do with with the creativity of this particular person, and the reason why that is is that this this memory is connected in some way to the impact created by a particular personality, and so it would not have worked. It would have been rejected outright if I would have walked into your house church and say, "Well, I heard Jesus was a pirate." You know, there's just no, there there are limits to the creativity and the the uh, you know the, the the memory distortion that can happen with a particular any, any kind of per, particular personality. Well, and and it also helped. You know, I remember in in uh, in my schooling when they point out sort of the intentionality of it that the, hey, these gospels are next to each other. It's not like. One day they woke up and said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe we put these together. Did you notice that the, the details are different? <laughs> right? right. So they're, they're, it's like they did that intentionally. So there's a reason why the details are different. And that's far more interesting to me. You know, it's, it's always funny to me when people say, oh, well, that's just an interpretation. And for me, right. that's like this privileging of fact as though somehow that provides meaning. But it's, right. it's far more interesting to ask, what are the implications of these facts? What do they mean? Sure. And like the gospel writers and the communities that form are more interested in what do these events, what did this personality, what did this person and the events surrounding, what did that mean? And that's sort of the narrative they're constructing is based around that. Would that be that's, fair that's right. That's right. And, you know, I should, I should also add something that maybe your, your, your listeners, you know, might not want to embrace, but it, it's, here's the reality uh, of working in this field um, is that we have to make sense to each other. So when historians sit down at the table and start talking about this stuff, we have to speak in such a way that makes sense to the other people at the table. And so we are often going to have a, have uh, discussions about um, fictional f fictionalized narratives. Like to what extent did did certain fictions work their way into the Gospels? Now, if this is a if this is a group of people who uh, are, are are relatively uh, Christian conservative and view the Gospels in a particular way, that might be a highly offensive statement, and it may be something we don't we we don't want to talk about that. But if you sit down with historians who may profess a different faith or they may profess no faith at all. That's not a question that we can be, really the historian can really be offended by. We need to be open to be able to start having those conversations. Why does this, why, why does this particular thing look so much like a fictional narrative? And mm -hmm. why doesn't it look like a fictional narrative to you? And that, that really does generate a, a lot of our conversation when it comes to the Gospels because there are so many accounts of, of, of the supernatural in these, in these accounts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, I think sometimes this, this happened a few years ago to me where we had Thanksgiving dinner at my house with about 15 or 16 people, which never happens. And one family member couldn't be there. And I remember thinking to myself, how could I commemorate this event to her? Right. And I began thinking to myself, what would I even say? I'd have to be so selective. Like, I don't, I think I remember where everybody was sitting. Right. And I sort of track with the conversation, but I, my memory is not perfect. 
And then I start doing very intentional things like, you know, here are these jokes that were told and I tell them right in a row, even though hours went by in between them. And if somebody else were to sort of explain that event to the same person, they, they would have a very different angle simply because they're human beings. Right. Right. What you're describing is what um, a scholar by the name of Alan Kirk would really emphasize as the, 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 the core narrativization of memory. It, it, like, for instance, if you and I were sitting down at a bar together and, you know, we, we, we spent a couple hours there and, um, you know, we would probably distill those two hours into, you know, maybe 30 seconds. If we, if we had to recall them, but the things that we would remember most are the jokes, and the reason here's the reason why, because they're things that we've already committed to memory, or or here's another way to do it, if it's like a family story at Thanksgiving that you've told a million times, and everyone at the table has heard this particular family story a million times, guess what? Guess what part of that evening will remain intact? It's probably the story or the joke that has a narrative structure and therefore it has sort of a mnemonic stability that will carry into the next conversation or the next social grouping. And, and by mnemonic stability, you mean it's, it's memorable. Like we remember stories and jokes. There's a particular structure to it. Yeah, it's not just memorable. It's it's memorable. It's memorable in a particular way. It's 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 memorable in a way in which the, the salient details are hard to hard to alter. You know, there, it's really difficult to take a a joke that has a particular kind of structure and to to convolute it because you you really need the joke to go to go to the punchline, you need the punchline to work, and which means that you've got to memorize the, the internal structure of that particular joke. So that there are, if you look at the Gospels, there are little stories. There are little stories that are told, and they're just small enough to, to, be, to have a particular little narrative structure. And we would imagine in that some of these conversations between Jesus and his disciples or Jesus and the Pharisees, that these things went on for hours and hours and hours. But it, what we're getting in the Gospels is we're getting a distilled version and maybe a, a, maybe a more stereotypical version of what these longer conversations kind of look like. And we're really getting the gist of the conversation. Yeah, this purposeful narration of Jesus for communities. But that, that to me, that's just fascinating. That makes so much sense to me about why they're different. I mean, how can they not be different? Right. I mean, shouldn't we be suspicious if they were exactly the same? I mean, right. and, and what would be the point of keeping four if they were exactly the right. same? And then this, the Dia Tesseron that you mentioned at the beginning, yes. that in and of itself is just simply another act of, I guess, commemoration. It's not getting it right. That's right, exactly. So here's what we'll do. Here's what we like to do. And of course, you know, it's early September, so of course we should talk about Christmas, right? Yeah. Um, if we, what we like to do with these Christmas pageants is we like to, it's to depend on how many children you have in the church, you've got to have a role for every one of the kids. So you're going to have angels over here and uh, magi over here, and someone's going to be a star, and someone's going to be angels. Um, and uh, someone. My, my daughter was baby Jesus when. She okay, was, that's good. Which was the beginning of my slide down to liberal. <laughs> I can I can actually locate when it's right. right then and there. But if we sit down and closely look at these narratives, there's a reason why Matthew talks about the Magi and Luke doesn't, and there's a reason why Luke talks about shepherds and Matthew doesn't. It fits in with their narr- the, the story that they're trying to tell. And in our attempt to harmonize this story into one single, you know, narrative that fits Mark or Matthew and Luke together, um, what we're doing is we're we're we are neglecting the, the the story that Matthew thought was so important to tell, and that the early church thought so important to keep separate to keep this particular version of the infancy narrative 
that looks like this different from the other one that looks like that? Uh huh. Well, okay, Anthony, listen, this is, we could go on for hours about this and, and I, we, we need to sort of draw it to a close, but one quick comment. And then I sort of want to ask you just uh, some, some questions for the benefit of our listeners, but you know, it's just, what I'm hearing in all this is another way of putting it. Respect what the gospel writers are trying to do and why they were trying to do it and not be too obsessed with, let's call it factuality, where everything has to fit together nicely. That's actually disrespecting the gospel stories. Right. Yeah, I think. Are you are you down with that, or did I just say something really? Strange? No, no. I think that's right. I think we are. Uh, I think that we we work with facts. It's important to work with facts, but it's it's also important to realize that these facts exist within the context of human memory. Yeah, and so we shouldn't expect yeah. we shouldn't expect the gospels to to do something that they're not intending to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the larger question that, you know, some, some uh, you know, Christians would be very interested in this, others less so, but whatever you might think of inspiration works within that. You know, right, works within yeah. that social memory construct narrative thingy we've been talking about. Yeah, so whatever, whatever your, your view is of the, the, the notion of the, the, the scripture being God-breathed, um, humans were involved, and uh, and and that's that's something that 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 both the believer and the historian can gr agree upon. Right. That uh, whatever the process was, humans were certainly involved in the process. Right. Okay. Well, listen, Anthony, that that's been fantastic. Now, uh, just as we close down, uh, is there any place online where people can find you uh, apart from Christian Mingle? Any, any place? <laughs> Um, yeah, I, 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 I have your wife now. Anyway. Yeah, no, I, I don't have an, a Christian Mingle profile. Um, it's but, really cool. Uh, you ought to get one. <laughs> if you wanted to find me online, um, I, I blog at a, at a website called the Jesus blog. Um, and that's a, a pretentious name for a blog. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Almost anyway, as ahead. pretentious as as uh, the Bible for normal people. Yes, true, true. <laughs> Touche. So, so yeah. So I, 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 you know, along with a few other uh, uh, Jesus specialists, I blog there. And then, of course, uh, I've got a few books in print, and you can get those wherever you get books. Right now, um, is there a project that you're bringing to completion or just completed? Um, yes, I just completed a book called Near Christianity right. um, as a, a, a play on Lewis's famous Mirror Christianity. Right. Um, and uh, that's that's been out for a few months. Right. And I've got uh, I've got three other books that are just coming, probably be out in the next uh, you know a few months. Oh wow. So, yeah, it it sounds like more than it is. One's a co-edited project, and one's co-written with with um, a mutual friend of ours, Larry Barrent. Yeah. And, and then one is called Jesus, a beginner's guide. Ooh. And that should be out in November. Tell me about the second one with Larry Barrent that you mentioned. Yeah, this is called uh, sacred dissonance. Yes. Um, how, um, how Jewish Christian dialogue can make us better Jews and Christians. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an interest. It's, it's kind of a, we take some hot button topics and places where Jews and Christians may find uh, some some uh, heat generated, some disagreement, and we we each write a chapter about these things, and then we dialogue about them. And just a plug, there is uh, one full section on social memory in that in that Ooh, book. That is a good plug. Yeah, so I'm excited. I'm also. I also just put out. I, I just came in the mail today. My copy of the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus, um, and it's it's a journal devoted to historical Jesus studies. And I edit this journal alongside a lot of um, really fine people. And so, if if you're interested in what historians have to say about Jesus. Uh, that that journal is put out by Brill. That, that's the, that's what I'm taking away, Anthony. Is that one day I, I aspire to being uh, someone who can call themselves a Jesus specialist? 
I what do you do? I specialize in Jesus. That's awesome. I've mastered Jesus. Anyway, I, Anthony, you're a very busy guy, and that's good to see because you've got a, a great mind and a, a lot, lot to say, to say. Mm-hmm. and we appreciate it. And you probably were too busy for this podcast. But well, no, I, I appreciate it. And, I, and I, I will say that I've enjoyed the podcast. Um, I, I've gotten to listen to most of the episodes that you – you uh, have put out and I, I, you're really on to something it's very, really entertaining and I always learn something we appreciate that thanks, thanks so much. Anthony alright Anthony thanks so much thank you for being on the podcast see ya see you later alright folks thanks for listening to this episode and if, if you want to sort of catch up with Anthony a little bit online as he said he blogs at the Jesus blog that very unpretentious name for a blog. And I want to push a couple of books that he uh, mentions uh, and that, that are his most recent books. One is Near Christianity, which he mentioned, How Journeys Along Jewish-Christian Borders Saved My Faith in God. So that's Near Christianity. And the other one is uh, Sacred Dissonance, The Blessings of Difference in Jewish and Christian Dialogue. And I, I just want to push those because I know that from my own vision for what the Christian faith can be. There's nothing that has pushed me more than thinking alongside Judaism, which out of which Christianity grew. I know that's sort of an obvious point to make, but nothing has challenged me more and also brought me more of a sense of, aha, I think I understand better now than by engaging this. So, and this is very much what Anthony is about as a New Testament scholar dialoguing with Jews about the nature of his own faith and his own faith growing as a result, which you might not think is the case, but it is. We also want to thank uh, all of our supporters on Patreon. Um, thank you for your support. And we invite you to go there, patreon.com, front slash the Bible for normal people. Uh, we have a lot of um, available content that's not available just in the podcast, uh, behind the scene pictures, videos. Pete has done a few Q&As that's available only to Patreon supporters. We also invite you to check out uh, the website, thebiblefornormalpeople.com. This last weekend, Brian McLaren was actually at my uh, church, and so Pete and I were there, and and Brian called out Pete in the middle of his presentation just to talk about um, the work. I owe money. I owe money. That's how I, yeah. yeah. But he called he called out Pete just for the good work that he's doing um, in his books like uh, The Bible Tells Me So and The Sin of Certainty, wrestling with a lot of uh, the questions that really fueled why we did this podcast in the first place. So check those out as well, again, at thebiblefornormalpeople.com and patreon.com front slash thebiblefornormalpeople. Alrighty. Thanks, folks. See you next time.